Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for the webinar on cancer and aging, microenvironmental impact on oxygenesis and immunity. My name is Jennifer, and I will be your WebEx host. Before we get started, I'd like to make a few comments. All lines have been muted upon entry and will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. Please submit your questions throughout the presentation in the chat or Q&A panel and select all panelists from the dropdown. We will ask them on your behalf during the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you need to view live closed captioning, please refer to the link that will appear momentarily in the chat panel. Please also note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted online at a later date. If you do not see any of the functionalities in terms of identifying the chat or the participants to contact us, please use the lower center navigation at the bottom of your WebEx screen. And with that, I will pass it over to Jennifer Guida to introduce our webinar series and our speakers. Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Cancer Institute's Perspectives on Cancer and Aging webinar series. We host this webinar to share our broad interest in cancer and aging research to honor our, Dr. Arthi Hurria's pioneering and impactful leadership of geriatric oncology and to highlight her legacy as an impassioned clinician, researcher, and mentor. As such, each webinar in this series um, showcases complementary cancer and aging research by scientific influencers at the tenured and junior academic and clinical levels. Today, we are pleased to feature Dr. James DeGregory and Dr. Curtis Henry. Dr. James DeGregory is a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, and he is currently Deputy Director of the University of Colorado Cancer Center. He holds the Courtenay and Lucy Patton Davis Endowed Chair in Lung Cancer Research. His lab seeks to understand how aging and other carcinogenic conditions promote cancer evolution and to discover pathway dependencies in cancer that can be exploited therapeutically. His lab studies the evolution of cancer in the context of their adaptive oncogenesis model with a focus on how aging, smoking, Down syndrome, and other insults influence cancer initiation and responses to therapy. The lab has developed this cancer model based on classic evolutionary principles and substantiated this model by theoretical experimental and computational studies. Dr. Curtis Henry is assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Emory University School of Medicine and a member of the Cancer Immunology Research Program at the Winship Cancer Institute. Dr. Henry received his undergraduate degrees in molecular biology and chemistry from Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University followed by a doctoral degree in immunology from Wake Forest University School of Medicine. Dr. Henry then ventured west to the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, where he conducted his postdoctoral fellowship under the mentorship of Dr. James DeGregory, and was then promoted to research instructor. Dr. Henry has received several prestigious grants, including the NCI-funded K01 Award, the UNCF Merck Postdoctoral Fellowship, and an American Cancer Society Junior Faculty Achievement Award as well as an AFLAC pilot grant and of recently the Mark Foundation for Cancer Research Aspire Award. Uh, research in Dr. Henry's laboratory focuses on understanding how aging and obesity promote the development of hematological malignancies with the goal of improving the efficacy of chemo and immune-based therapies in these high-risk demographics. Um, so welcome to our speakers, Dr. James DeGregory and Dr. Curtis Henry. And at this time, I will pass the reins over to Dr. James DeGregory. Thank you. Okay, everyone should see my screen. So first off, uh, thanks Dr. Guida. It's really a, an honor to uh, present at this. Um, I got to know Dr. Artie Hurria at one of the NCI and NIA uh, Cancer and Aging little mini symposia and um, she just was a huge influence on the cancer and aging field and has really been one of the pioneers in the area. And it's really was just a huge loss uh, when, when, when we lost her uh, about a year ago. Um, so without further ado, I'll be talking about connecting aging and cancer through the lens of evolution. So I'll start with sort of the obvious that everyone in this audience should know, and that's that about 90% of cancers develop after the age of 50. 
And this shows uh, a typical, let me actually um, change my pointer. This shows a typical curve where cancer is relatively rare for the first, you know, half of a century of our lives, and then becomes quite common, such as about a quarter of us will die from cancer, and about 40% of us will develop cancer. And most of that will be in later years. And I don't know why it's progressing without me telling it to. Uh, so the big question is, why? Why is that? And so from the conventional point of view, we can consider that, you know, there's time and cell divisions, and those generate mutations, different exposures like smoking, and of course, our underlying inherited genetics. And all of this leads to mutations. And it's these mutations that are thought to be the main drivers of cancer and thought to be the link between cancer and aging. But what I'll talk to you today about is that this current, so really this has led to the current paradigm that cancer incidence is limited by the occurrence of oncogenic mutations, such that one needs to accumulate a certain number of mutations through life in order to generate a cancer. And I'll try to shed some doubt on this simplistic thinking about cancer. So first off, we have to ask, has evolution been driven by the occurrence of the right mutations over time? And of course, the answer is no. And because we know that evolution has been driven by environmental changes. So we know that through this history of animal life and even plant life on our planet, there's a huge diversity of such animals and that there's been huge changes in the species that have inhabited Earth. And these different periods are often marked by huge changes in the environment, such as meteors that hit off the, hit off the Yucatan 65 million years ago, periods when there's large volcanic activity, major changes in temperature and atmospheric gases, and even, you know, a period when the Earth was completely enveloped in ice. And these changes in environment thus stimulated um, the evolution of new types, new phenotypes that were adaptive to this new environment. And that's really how evolution works. So this we can really ask, are the patterns of cancer incidence during lifetime best explained by sequential accumulation of oncogenic mutations, the conventional view, or do we need to consider extrinsic factors? And I'm sorry, this, my, my, my slides are moving forward without me, and I don't know why that is. I must have it on some timing, but I'll try to cope with it. So, so this is work that, that Andre Rosak in my lab did uh, a number of years ago. Uh, that we published last year. And what Andre wanted to ask is if we look at cancer incidence, so if we look at the incidence of different leukemias, we could see that they have this age dependence. But I'll note that CML is known to be driven by a single driver mutation, while uh, AML and CLL are driven by multiple. And at the same time, if we look at different solid malignancies, colorectal cancer is thought to be driven by anywhere from four to 11 different variants of different mutations and mesothelioma by one and so forth. But you can see that there's a huge variance in the number of driver mutations thought to drive cancers, probably by about tenfold. And even though we know these numbers are somewhat soft because you know there could be epigenetic changes, large structural variations that aren't accounted for here, I think we could safely say that the number of drivers is quite variable. And in addition, these different cancers arise in stem cell pools that differ enormously by their numbers. So we, we have tens of millions of different stem cells that occupy our colon, for example, that, and each of these is organized in little small crypts. Well, we have on somewhere in the order of about 100,000 stem cells that maintain our blood system, the hematopoietic system. And, the, um, and, and, and so we could think about these different stem cell pools from this perspective and ask ourselves, well then, wouldn't we expect with these different numbers of drivers and these different numbers of stem cells to see very different incidence curves for cancer? And yet when, when, uh, Kurt, when uh, uh, Andre did a very simple thing, he simply normalized cancer incidence to its maximum and its minimum, you could see that the curves for very different cancers have very similar incidence. And even this phenomena of clonal hematopoiesis, which we know is driven by really probably just a single oncogenic variant, shows a very similar pattern. So we have to think about this. How could, why would we have such a similar pattern of cancers despite the huge differences in numbers of drivers and the stem cell pool? So from the conventional modeling perspective, this simply doesn't work. But what Andre did is he used a Monte Carlo model, and don't worry, I'm not gonna go into any of the math, but 
essentially what he showed is that if he included a parameter whereby selection was negative, you selected against the oncogenic mutations through youth, and then somewhere about midlife, you switched over to selecting positively for those oncogenic mutations. And using this differential parameter, he was able to very nicely recapitulate this differential, this very common curve for cancers despite differences in the number of drivers through life. And so we then need to think about, well, what would cause this differential? What would cause such differential selection? So the first thing we need to do is look from really a, a sort of a high perspective. Think about it from the evolutionary perspective. So we need to consider that there's really been minimal selection against cancer and other diseases of aging beyond the age where most individuals would already be dead by other causes. And so what do I mean by that? So first off, we can think about Europeans about 15,000 years ago, and this would probably be similar for people throughout the world, but we just had good fossil data from this group, and that, that living past 60 was rare. And so there were some individuals that lived into later years. There were some older individuals, but most individuals with every passing year had a, some odds that they weren't going to be around the next year, death by predation, uh, starvation, disease, et cetera. And so life was tough. And so, and if we look at modern incidences of cancer or really heart disease, kidney disease, pick your favorite age-dependent ailment, you can see that those are largely pushed off to the right side of this curve, and there's not a lot of overlap between these. So you might think, well, why didn't we still, you know, even for these little bit of overlap, why didn't we evolve better protection from these different diseases? And the reason is simple, because evolving even better protection, for example, anti-aging mechanisms or better cancer prevention mechanisms, would have required further investment in youth in maintenance of the, t of the soma, of the tissues. And that investment would have probably come at the cost of reproduction. Because remember, investments need to be made wisely, and there's a limited amount of resources, food mostly, to be invested. So for this reason, life is not linear. So your chance of dying in your 20th year, it's about your chance of dying in, it's about the same as your chance of dying in your 30th year despite the fact that you're now 10 years older and thus have basically are 10 years closer towards the end of your life. So why is that? Why is there sort of this maintenance, this relatively flat period where our risk of cancer is low, risk of heart disease is quite low? And then after about 40, we see that with every passing year, our odds of dying increases. And, and that just doesn't increase, it accelerates. So we don't just go downhill, we pick up speed. And this is the reason that age-dependent disease goes up in old life, just as our, our chance of surviving to the next year goes down. So then what does this investment in tissue maintenance during youth and the waning of this investment in old age have to do with cancer? And that's the theory that my lab's been developing for, I don't know, 15 years at this point that we term adaptive oncogenesis. And so this, this theory really has two key principles. The first one, in some ways I find to be the more interesting one, is why we don't get cancer for half a century. I mean, if you think about it, we've got about 40 trillion cells, and yet our odds of not getting a cancer from one of those 40 trillion cells is quite low through half of a century. That's quite a feat. The same thing if you think about, you know, just, just general non, not dying of anything. How do, we, how do we evolve a body that could be so large and yet have such a low rate of a breakdown and error through about half of a century. So what we think is that we've evolved tissues whereby we have stem and progenitor pools that are somewhere near a peak of fitness. So what I mean by fitness is the ability to persist within a tissue, to maintain that epigenotype or genotype within a tissue. And so that if you get a mutation, even an oncogenic mutation, even a cancer-causing mutation, it's gonna to tend to cause a reduction in fitness, not an increase. And so even if there's some malignant genotype over here, if getting there means going through a low fitness intermediate, it's going to be difficult. And I use words like that on purpose because I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just going to be unlikely to happen. So we know that a 30-year-old can get a cancer, just a 30-year-old is less likely to get a cancer. So that's at a young, healthy stem cell pool. The status quo is favored. But what about when we get old or if we do things like we smoke? So you can now imagine a stem cell in the lungs of a, of a young per, I mean, of an older person, or perhaps even the lungs of an older smoker. And now that stem cell does not find itself well adapted to its environment. 
We didn't evolve stem cells to be adapted to the lungs of an old smoker, for example. And now there's room for adaptation. So just like the, you know, the species that inhabited Earth at the time of the meteor that hit off the Yucatan 65 million years ago, just like those species basically were provided, you know, with an opportunity for adaptation to this new environment, the same thing can happen in our lungs or in any tissue when we get old or if we smoke or do other exposures. And this provides an opportunity for malignant evolution that didn't exist before. So about, I don't know, it was some, some time in the last decade, we decided to test some of these ideas. And, and one of the first, and first people in my lab uh, was to, to, to ask these sorts of questions in an aged environment was Dr. Curtis Henry, who you'll be hearing about next. And what Curtis wanted to address, he wanted to ask, well, if we were to put an oncogenic variant into early stem and progenitor cells from uh, the matapoietic system of a mouse, put in an oncogene, in this case, there was the NRAS mutation, and then we put those into mice and we only changed the environment. In other words, all we changed was how old those mice were and whether they were inflammatory. So we put them either into young mice, old mice, or these old mice that also bore an IL-37 transgene, which blocks the IL-1 pathway. So it's an anti-inflammatory uh, transgene. And importantly, used a conditioning method that, was, we, that he showed was very non-inflammatory and didn't really disrupt the overall tissue numbers and the numbers of cells within the tissue. So a relatively non-disruptive method. And when he did that, one thing that was quite surprising is that these oncogenic variants did not have an advantage in young. And that really went against the current paradigm where people think that, well, the oncogenic mutation just automatically confers some fitness advantage. That was not the case. But instead, in the old background, those oncogenic mutations did confer an advantage and led to expansion of those clones. And, and that expansion could be thought of as an adaptation. So these were now, these mutations were now adaptive in that aged environment. Importantly, if he blocked inflammation, he could block that adaptation. So then he wanted to ask, well, why is this? And when he looked at different parameters of cell fitness, like signaling or different gene expression parameters, what he found is that these fitness parameters were often reduced in the old cells, as you can see here, and they're restored by oncogenic signaling, providing an explanation for why this oncogene was adaptive in this old pool, but not in the young pool. Remember, I would argue that the young pool already had the right amount of, of RAS activity. Importantly, when he had the uh, old host that had the IL-37 transgene, so they were anti-inflammatory, he prevented this reduction in the first place. And that can explain why the oncogenic event was not adaptive, because basically it didn't provide advantage because the cells were close enough to the normal peak, despite being old, that they prevented that adaptation. It took away that selective pressure. He sees the same thing with some of these gene expression events, and the level of restoration is variable, but apparently it was enough. So this leads us to a model where we would argue that, despite the fact that we accumulate damage, genetic damage, throughout our whole lives, in fact, we probably accumulate quite a bit of it, you know, during their our first year or two of life, because that's when we want to go through a lot of cell divisions to make the body, that there's stabilizing selection acting on these mutations. So essentially, it's pushing down on the selective advantage of these events, leading to this trough in our cancer incidence. But late in life, when natural selection no longer was sort of, there was no longer natural selection to maintain the fitness of our, or the, the integrity of our soma, our tissues. Now with that tissue breakdown and the increased inflammation that comes along with it, we get positive selection for some of these same oncogenic events. And there's been a lot of recent examples from the literature uh, showing uh, now in humans that if we look in tissues of the elderly, we see a lot more clonal expansions of, of these oncogenic clones than we do when people were young. And I'll note that this is not a complete list. So now we're going to turn and ask, why does aging cause lung cancer? And so this is work from several talented people in my lab, Kathy Pham Danis, Hannah Scarborough, and Nate Little. And what they were going off on is the fact that, you know, we know that obviously lung cancer incidence, whether you get lung cancer, 
Well, that's determined by whether or not you smoke. So this is the lung cancer curve for current smokers and never smokers. But when you look at the log log scale, you can see that basically when you get it, it's determined by your age. So on a log log scale, there's a highly age dependent incidence of cancer, whether in smokers or never smokers. And this is true for men and women. So we know that the, the lungs, aging in lungs is associated with a number of physiological um, uh, changes. A lot of it have to do with the immune system. So there's a decline in adaptive immunity, but a, an upregulation of more inflammatory immunity. There's also decreased uh, parameters of sort of lung function that happen as we age. So, so what they wanted to ask was, well, does this change the ability of an oncogenic variant to be adaptive in the lung? And they use an adenoviral method that introduces in this, uh, doesn't introduce in the fusion. So the EML4 out fusions are common in lung cancers of the elderly, uh, specifically largely associated with people that don't smoke. So there's aging associated. What they did is introduced in CRISPR constructs where, it, where you basically generate a break in the ALK gene and a break in the EML4 gene so that you get a spontaneous flippage of this piece of the chromosome. So we're inducing endogenous EML4 ALK events just like they would occur in the lungs of a, of a human, for example. And one of the first things we want to know is, well, do we have to worry about just the fact that perhaps these events are happening more often in old than in young. And that turned out not to be the case. We're just using phosphostat 3 It's kind of a proxy for these events, and I won't go into details on that. But the numbers and frequency of these events looking very soon after transduction, after introducing the virus, are quite similar. But when the end asked, okay, what about six weeks later when we give time for these events to either form an adenoma or not? And what they find is in young mice, we got rare adenomas. Only two of the five or six mice that are shown along this uh, x-axis here, each dash is a mouse, developed one adenoma each. In middle age, we also got a pretty similar low number of adenomas. But in the old mice, we got multiple adenomas per mouse, and we got bigger adenomas as well. So there's a big increase in the frequency of adenomas in the old mice, despite we known that we had similar transduction efficiency. And one of the other things that they noticed was that there was a big increase in these sort of almost tertiary lymph node-like structures, little lymph node-like structures filled up with a lot of lymphocytes, some granulocytes, and some macrophages. I won't go into details on that. But there was a lot more of these in the old mice than in the young mice. So we're seeing more immune aggregates in old age. So then what they did is they turned to these uh, mice that express alpha-1 antitrypsin. So this, this is a, uh, an antiprotease, but it basically, it blocks the neutrophilic protease reaction that can lead to a lot of inflammation in the lung. So it's essentially anti-inflammatory. And you can see that here is that, and this is actually work from Curtis from his paper. So Curtis had shown previously that in the bone marrow, we get increases in, in cytokines like TNF-alpha in old age, and that the AAT transgenic can prevent that. And we see the same thing in serum, and we see this for other cytokines as well. And what they also notice is that this increase in immune lesions in the old mice lungs is also largely reversed by expression of AET. So Kathy went on to show that uh, AET also reverses a lot of age-dependent gene expression changes in the lung. And I'm not going to go into details on this, but this is just a way of showing an increase in a lot of these genes in old. And these are reversed back down by AET expression. And it's just a number of different immune signaling pathways where we see this. So then the question is, well, if we block this inflammatory type response, do we prevent this oncogenic adaptation leading to adenomas? So now we repeated the experiment. And again, in the young mice, we see very few adenomas, and they tend to be small. In the old mice, almost all the mice get adenomas, and they tend to get multiple adenomas, and they can tend to get very large adenomas. Importantly, when those old mice were AET transgenic, this anti-inflammatory transgene, we basically got a pattern that was very similar to young-like. Very few adenomas, and um, only a few of the mice even got adenomas. And I'll note that um, we also looked in rag mutant mice. What these mice are, they lack T and B cells, so they don't have adaptive immunity. But these were young. So we simply want to ask, well, would losing the adaptive immune system be sufficient to cause these adenomas? 
And the answer turned out to be no, it was not sufficient. So we got a small increase in the number of adenomas, but really not much. And it probably can't account for this big increase that we get in old age. So then I mean there's no role for the adaptive immune system. It just means it's losing the adaptive immune system is not sufficient. So we then did some um, um, analysis of the protein components of these lungs. And we want to know were there changes in this protein milieu, and particularly in the extracellular matrix, that might explain these differences. And so I'll first note that there are some changes that happen in old age like these that go up in old age and go back down. And these included some of proteins involved in tissue remodeling, some inflammatory proteins. But I'll also note that there's a lot of stuff that changes in old age that does not get reversed by, um, by the expression of AT. So it's not a complete reversal. So a few lessons from this is that, because we know that the old AT pretty much completely squashed tumor genesis. So we apparently don't need to completely rejuvenate a tissue to avoid oncogenesis. We just need to figure out what the key aging-dependent changes are, and I think that's an important question. And then we need to figure out how to modulate these factors safely. I'll mention that I don't think that anti-inflammatories are the solution. We have to remember that inflammation is, is, may contribute to some of the you know, disease, path, the pathologies of old age, but it's also really important for preventing us from dying of an infection. So just simply anti-inflammatories aren't going to do the trick. I'll also mention that we have looked in, in data sets for for humans throughout the lifespan. And we see some of the same in the lungs, we see some of the same increases in inflammatory pathways, senescence associated pathways, and also extracellular matrix remodeling pathways. So many of the changes in the human lung mirror those that we've observed in the mouse. So just to sort of sum this up, the conventional view would, would propose that the causes of cancer, like aging, smoking, radiation exposure, and you pick it, they're mostly causing cancer by causing mutations. This leads to malignant phenotypes. And when people consider the, the tumor microenvironment, they're mostly thinking about this coming and being generated from the malignant phenotypes. So what I've been talking about is that the cause, like aging, smoking, et cetera, that these are really inducing microenvironmental changes, like inflammation and, and changes in tissue remodeling, and that this promotes selection for adaptive mutations. Think back to that, that picture of sort of that life history of Earth and how changes on Earth have promoted speciation. Same thing that's happening in our lungs. But I'll also point out these are not mutually exclusive. And as the cancer grows, indeed, malignant phenotypes do induce microenvironmental changes, which will induce further selection and so forth. So we need to think about these in conjunction. And so throughout this talk, I've referred to this youthful soma, you know, our youthful tissues as being intrinsically tumor suppressive. And so obviously the solution is let's maintain our youthful tissues. Well, it's not that easy, but I do think it's important that we consider how it naturally happens. So we know there are mechanisms of cell competition, peer pressure happening in our cells, immune surveillance. Cell intrinsic quality control, but if a cell basically becomes rogue, it can just die by apoptosis or senescence. We also have you know, tr cell intrinsic mechanisms like repair type functions. And of course, we have redundancy. You know, I mentioned we have thousands of stem cells. So if we lose a stem cell, it's probably no big deal for at least a while. And this is all important for maintaining that youthful soma. And then why is that relevant? Why does this matter? Well, because a youthful soma is what natural selection is acted on because this keeps us robust, keeps our tissues functioning well, it functions in our immune defense, avoiding other diseases, and as I've been talking about, it's anti-cancer. But I think a lesson here is that we shouldn't think about cancer as being a different type of aging-associated disease. It's one of the many things the natural selection has acted to avoid through our, our youth. And I, we can also think about this in the perspective of COVID-19. So, you know, this is, again, a, a curve of, of disease incidence as we get old. The colored stuff is cancer. Then some of this is heart disease. And you can see that your chance of dying of really anything just goes up as you get older. And the same thing is true for COVID infections. Almost the same curve. It's very age dependent. So I think the take home message is that we need to, you know, think about efforts to prevent and treat cancer, that they need to converge with the similar efforts to prevent other aging associated diseases. 
And so we need better means to shore up our bodies, the soma, to improve defenses against malignant actors. And we need to leverage markers of a declining soma as an ecosystem check on our soma. And so with that, I, I've already thanked people that have really worked on this throughout and have uh, great support from the NIA and have had support from the NCI before that and the Cancer League of Colorado, wonderful collaborators. And I'll mention that all the artwork that I showed you is done by my son, um, and it's also featured in my book. And with that, I'll stop sharing. Oh, that's, there's the whole lab and the Zoom, of course. And uh, go back to uh, main features. And thanks, everyone. Thank you, James. And with that, we'll turn it over to Curtis. Curtis, you have the presentation control, so feel free to get started whenever. So, James, really, really nice presentation, and uh, thank you for setting me up. So, just to reiterate, uh, my name is Curtis uh, Henry. I'm an assistant professor of pediatrics at Emory University, a proud member of the Aflac Cancer and Blood Disorder Center. And before I begin, um, as James did, um, I really want to thank the organizers of this of this conference for providing me an opportunity to speak. Um, it's a very timely conference, given that the age population is is continuing to increase worldwide. And I strongly feel that we need to do a better job of discussing and figuring out ways to treat these populations. So before I begin, I think it's very important for me to address um, the elephant in the room, so to speak, which is why is there an apple tree um, at the beginning of um, this presentation? And essentially, this is an analogy like that we like to use in the lab, um, kind of following the old adage that apple doesn't fall too far away from the tree. Um, as James mentioned um, in my in his lab. Um, I actually studied hematopoiesis and trying to understand uh, how aging-associated inflammation regulated these processes. And since then, we've translated this, uh, this research to really focusing on how modulating aging-associated inflammation impacts um, the function of mature immune cells, which is uh, essentially the topic of, of today, um, where I'm going to share data with you to suggest that if we can effectively reduce aging-associated inflammation, uh, we can get more potent anti-T-cell uh, immune responses against leukemia, and this also may translate into improvements um, in the efficacy of CAR T-cell-based therapies. Um, but before we get into the data, I think it's, it's important to do, go back and revisit the importance of understanding aging-associated research, and um, I think that's summarized very nicely here um, in this cartoon generated by the World Health Organization, which is looking at the percentage of, of young and older people um, here, less than five years old or greater than 65, um, from 1950 to 2050, um, as um, predicted by uh, the algorithms used in this paper. And really the take home message is, we are finally at a period in life where the older population is exceeding the younger population. And then based on mathematical modeling, um, it's predicted that this gap will continue to increase over the next few decades. Um, but just to put a few uh, numbers to this slide, um, if we look at the global world population um, above the age of 65, it was exactly 524 million individuals, and it's predicted to triple by 2050 and reach 1.5 billion people worldwide. Now, the one thing I want to say is this is a great accomplishment for humanity, um, being able to actually uh, uh, reach a point where we can um, have long, long life and, and, and longevity, but I also argue that it's a double-edged sword. Um, and so the reason why um, having a large aging population concerns me is uh, historically our inability to effectively treat older populations. Um, so this is data generated from the SEER database looking at uh, cancer-related deaths of, of any type um, showing you the percent of death on the y-axis and different age groups along the x-axis. And what you can clearly see is that the number of cancer-related uh, deaths actually is highest in older populations, particularly those after uh, 55 years of age. Um, in my laboratory, uh, we're interested in leukemia research, and unfortunately, the same trend holds true, that we're um, less effective at uh, treating um, aged populations with leukemia, which leads to higher death rates uh, for aged individuals um, with these diseases. And so hopefully this um, emphasizes the need to have symposiums um, such as the ones that we're having today, and then also, um, you know, places an emphasis on our need to develop better therapeutics 
uh, for older patients with, with cancer. Um, and so that brings us to the concept that, that we really like to focus on in the laboratory, which is this idea that you can actually modulate um, biological aging and increase health span. So this is what this graph is showing, that, there, that biological aging and chronological aging um, aren't the same thing, but however, they may influence each other. And as James mentioned, if you do things um, that could impact biological aging, such as smoking, um, you actually may reduce your biological age or actually accelerate your biological age, and you may actually be more prone to developing diseases at an earlier period in life. Now, if you diet and exercise and do other things that may slow down um, your biological age, the ideal is that you're less likely to develop disease. And even if you do develop disease, your body or your soma may have a better opportunity to fight off the disease. Um, and so, again, the idea is that this may be a mod um, this process may be um, able to be modulated by certain things like anti-inflammatory drugs or targeted therapies that target specific cytokines. And that's just reiterated here. In my laboratory, we really think that you can modulate biological aging. This will impact disease development and potentially responses to therapies. And I'll share our data um, along these lines with you um, today. But before I go on, um, I'll be remiss if I didn't thank the awesome people that I have to work with in my laboratory. Um, um, my laboratory is relatively small, as you see the current members here, but we have an army of undergraduate and master students that feel compelled to come work with us, so I always welcome them with open arms. So if you guys are online today, thank you for, for your hard work and efforts, and I'm excited to share um, the work primarily of uh, Mr. Jamie Hamilton today, who is a fourth-year uh, student in my laboratory in the Cancer Biology Program. And so when Jamie and I really try to um, initiate looking at these studies, the first thing we wanted to focus on and really kind of the main area of focus is what are the immunological changes um, associated with aging? And Jamie and I were very fortunate to actually publish a review article in Aging and Cancer last fall on this topic. And this is just a, a highlight of what we, um, um, what we um, demonstrated in this review article. Um, and the things that we found through our research is that aging is associated with kind of a global immunological decline. You can see um, defective function of dendritic cells, which are professional APCs, reduced T cell activation. Again, an area of focus of our laboratory is this deregulated chronic inflammation, also known as inflammation in aged populations, and then increased immunosuppressive uh, population. And outcomes um, associated with these changes include decreased vaccine efficacy, increased infections, also an increased preponderance of developing autoimmune diseases, and it's been thought that these changes also decrease um, immune surveillance against cancer cells. And so Jamie and I um, postulated that if we could actually mitigate or reduce aging-associated um, inflammation, that we could actually increase the function of our T cells, and then um, by, by that product, increase the ability of HT cells to eradicate and control um, leukemia cells. And so, again, that's the topic of uh, today's talk. And so the way that we wanted to modulate or reduce um, aging associated chronic, chronic inflammation is through the uh, uh, studying this anti-inflammatory cytokine interleukin-37. And throughout the talk, I'll just refer to interleukin-37 as IL-37. Now, we were first exposed to um, IL-37 um, when I was a postdoctoral fellow in James de Gregory's lab, as he mentioned. Um, Charles Dinarello is a, is a great friend and colleague. He actually, actually discovered IL-37, and he was kind enough to give us with these IL-37 transgenic mice that I refer to at several points in the presentation today. But I just want to highlight that IL-37, since Charles discovered it, has been shown to be a very potent inhibitor of inflammation, um, particularly innate immunity, um, as demonstrated in his seminal paper published in Nature Immunology in 2010. Um, Charles has continued to um, do work in this field along with many other people and has subsequently shown that um, IL-37 can actually uh, control um, different diseases associated with aging, such as obesity and then um, also chronic colitis. And as James mentioned, uh, we were very fortunate to publish a paper in, 20, uh, in 2015, which shows is how reducing aging-associated uh, inflammation can improve the function of the progenitor cells and, and, and in that manner suppress uh, the development uh, or the expansion of, of oncogenic B cells. And so knowing that this model was so uh, effective in restoring um, B lymphopoiesis or uh, the function of B progenitor cells, Jamie and I really wanted to determine could we see the same thing in mature immune cells, and that's where we focused um, um, a lot of our attention over the past few years. 
And so before we begin looking at just what were the gross anatomy of IL-37 transgenic mice when they aged, uh, we wanted to really look at what would happen if we injected either aged wild type mice or aged um, IL-37 transgenic mice with very aggressive uh, leukemia cells. And these are BLL cells, so B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia cells that harbor the oncoprotein um, BCR able, and they like the tumor suppressor R. So you can actually inject these cells into mice without the need of myeloablation. So you keep your immune system intact and you don't disturb your, um, your immune microenvironment or inflammation. And so when we actually inject these uh, leukemia cells into these um, aged, either wild type of IL-37 transgenic mice, what we find in the case of the wild type mice, which is shown here by these gray hatch bars, is that all of the mice actually su succumb to the disease within two months. And this is in stark contrast to the aged IL-37 transgenic mice, where we see that there's a large percentage of mice that will actually survive indefinitely. And so what this experiment told us is that even if you um, initiate the disease and have a very aggressive cancer, that IL-37 offered a, a pretty significant uh, degree of protection in models of, of BALL. And so we next wanted to understand more about what did these mice present from an inflammatory standpoint and from an immunity standpoint that could modulate uh, BLL development? And what we found by looking at the systemic cytokine levels, and I'm just showing you TNF-alpha here as an example, we saw similar trends for IL-6 and IL-1 beta, that um, as expected, you get this aging-associated increase in circulating TNF-alpha levels in the aged wild-type mice. But surprisingly, you actually block that response in the aged um, IL-37 transgenic mice, and these mice actually have a youthful um, circulating inflammatory profile. And so um, we were very uh, excited to, to observe um, this impact on inflammation. And then also looking at the mice, we were surprised to see that you have a, a very specific uh, outcome on the spleen in the, in the aged IL-37 transgenic mice compared to the aged wild-type mice. Um, aging is associated in mice with this um, increase in spleen size known as splenomegaly. You can see um, the size relative to a young um, mouse's spleen and then also this significant increase in weight. But again, the take home here is that if you have IO-37 expressed transgenically, you actually prevent um, splenomegaly and you can see that both in phenotype as well as uh, the weights of the spleens. So at this point, we begin to hypothesize that, hey, maybe we can actually use IO-37 as a therapy um, and so we actually collaborated with Elon Essemeyer, who is an associate professor at the University of Colorado, and we essentially asked Elon, um, could he make recombinant IL-37 for us to use in subsequent experiments? And he was kind enough to do so. And what we found is if you actually start injecting old mice, so now these are old wild-type mice with that chronic inflam inflammatory environment, as you can see here, I'm showing you TNF-alpha levels. Um, in the serum, if you actually treat these mice for two weeks with recombinant IL-37, you're able to significantly de decrease circulating TNF-alpha levels. And so we wanted to see, um, did you have any, have any effects on the spleen populations as well? And so when we use flow cytometry to, uh, to calculate the percentage of CD4 and CD8 positive T cells and look at the ratio of these cells, what we found is aging is actually associated with the skewing of this, uh, of this ratio such that you actually use, lose your T helper cells but however, if you treat aged mice with the recombinant IL-37, you're actually able to restore a more youthful frequency of CD4 to CD8 positive T cells in the spleen. So we were very interested in the splenic effect of uh, recombinant IL-37. So we began to ask the question, in addition to changing the frequency, um, do you also um, restore the function of aged CD4 and CD8 positive T cells? And that's the data that I'm showing you here. And so what we did was, again, we took aged wild-type mice, 24 months old. Um, we treated these mice with either the control protein or recombinant IL-37 for two weeks. At that point, we isolated CD4 and CD8 positive T cells, and we stimulated these T cells ex vivo with um, PNMA and anamycin, which is a strong stimulation. And what we find is, as expected, if you look at PD-1 levels in the red boxes here, and I'm showing you the MFI, which is the amount expressed on the cell surface or the average amount expressed on the cell surface, we can see that if uh, these T cells are isolated from aged mice treated with the control IG, um, you do get an upregulation of PD-1, which is actually prevented um, if these T cells were derived from mice treated with um, recombinant IL-37. And then that's just shown here quantitatively over multiple experiments that having IL-37 in the equation actually will reduce PD-1 expression, suggesting that your T cells are less exhausted. And furthermore, um, to support this notion, uh, we looked at IL-2 and interferon gamma production from these same T cells. 
Um, these are two uh, cytokines important uh, for effector T cell function. Um, what we see is this aging associated T cell senescence when we look at um, IL2 and interferon gamma, such that when we stimulate these cells, you see that um, less than 30% of these cells are capable of making either cytokine. However, this is in stark contrast if these T cells are derived from aged mice treated with recombinant IL-37, you're able to significantly turn on interferon gamma production. And you can see that both in the percentage as well as the amount of IL-2 and interferon gamma um, made by these T cells on a per cell basis. So on a molecular level, what we hypothesized was happening is maybe IL-37, as previously shown in work by Charles, is suppressing NF-kappa B um, activity directly in aged T cells. And it's also known that NF-kappa B drives PD-1 surface expression. So we really wanted to look at this relationship. So in these experiments, we isolated aged T cells and stimulated these T cells in vitro with anti-CD3, CD28, which should activate the TCR and subsequent pathways. And we did this importantly um, in the presence of recombinant TNF-alpha, which is always at high levels in the age backgrounds, um, with or without recombinant IL-37. And just to orient you to this slide, what we find if you look at phospho NF-kappa B activation along this x-axis here, uh, we find that you indeed um, induce NF-kappa B activation, which can be um, further um, increased in the presence of TNF-alpha. However, if IL-37 is in the, in the equation indicated here by these green hist histograms, um, you actually um, reduce NF-kappa B activation. So it suppresses the ability of TNF-alpha to activate what is known as this uh, pro-inflammatory transcription factor. And we can see this uh, um, phenomenon in both CD4 as well as CD8 positive T cells. Um, that's just showing here graphically that tnf alpha can indeed induce um, um, NF-kappa B activation in CD4s and CD8s, but it's blocked by recombinant IL-37 addition to uh, these experiments. Now, in addition to blocking or abrogating um, um, NF-kappa B activation mediated by tnf alpha treatment, we also see a parallel in PD-1 surface expression that when you add um, in, um, TNF alpha, you get um, increased PD-1 surface expression on both CD4s and CD8 positive T cells, and this is flow cytometric data, and you actually lose PD-1 again when a recombinant IL-37 is in the equation. And so just to summarize data that I showed you from the first half of my talk, when we look at um, mature immune cells, what we find is that IL-37 in the age background can actually prevent splenomegaly. Um, it restores a youthful frequency of CD4 and CD8 positive T cells. It can attenuate TNF-alpha mediated NF-kappa B activation. Um, it reduces um, a marker of T cell exhaustion, PD-1, as well as TIGIT on aged T cells. And it also increases the effective capacity of T cells, leading to increased proliferation and cytokine production. And so we were really, really excited about the ability of IL-37 to activate or rejuvenate, if you would, um, aged T cells. And so we wanted to figure out if you actually did this in the context of uh, BALL development, would this provide a protective effect? So that's the experiment that Jamie and I set out to do, which is described here. And so essentially we went back to our old mouse models uh, and our mice again are 24 months old. We depleted CD4 and CD8 positive T cells, and then we started treating the mice before we gave them cancer with the control IG or recombinant IL-37. And we essentially had two hypotheses going into this experiment. Um, the first hypothesis was that T cells were going to be absolutely required for controlling B BLL uh, pathogenesis. And the second um, hypothesis was the improvements in the T cell responses would lead to better leukemia control. And that's exactly what we found. Um, if you focus your eyes on the group that jumps out um, at you uh, the most, which is the black line, and these are wild-type mice or aged mice that can have an intact immune system, so both CD4 and CD8 positive T cells receiving recombinant IL-37 treatment, what we found is that a large percentage of these mice actually did not succumb to the disease, whereas in every other group, the mice died. So if you actually depleted um, CD4, CD8 positive T cells, you lost disease control. And even if um, the mice had a, an intact immune system, if they didn't receive recombinant IL-37 treatment, they also lost disease control. So um, our conclusion from these experiments was that you absolutely need T cells to control both CD4s and CD8s to control BLL development and, and keep the disease in control. And you can actually boost these responses with treating the mice with um, recombinant IL-37. And so we um, postulated at this point that maybe you could boost the efficacy of aged CAR T cells. And the reason why we thought that CAR T cell um, activity or function could be improved is from the following uh, hypothesis. 
um, you know, one of the things that, you know, we think should be given more attention is that when you're generating or, or engineering CAR T cells, that you have to think about the patient that, the, um, that you're getting the, CAR, the, getting the T cells from or the endogenous T cells from. And so AIDS patients, again, are associated with compromised T cell mediated immunity. And so you may be engineering bad soldiers to go do a job. And then you're putting those soldiers in hostile territory. Again, AIDS populations are associated with chronic inflammation. And so we really wanted to address does IO-37 or could IO-37 improve the function of AIDS CAR T cells? So the first experiment we did was actually just to simply take AIDS CAR T cells, put them into mice, um, and these are AIDS mice in this case, and then treat the mice with either control, um, IG, or recombinant IO-37, and essentially use the mice as an incubator in the absence of disease, and then determine if you improved uh, uh, CAR T cell function even without disease. And so when we did that and treated the mice for two weeks, isolated the CAR T cells ex vivo, stimulated the CAR T cells in vitro with actually leukemia cells, and these are BALL cells, so these are CD19 directed CAR T cells. What we find is if you just put these cells in aged mice and stimulate these cells with the leukemia cells, you're only able to uh, get around 10% of the cells making IL-2 and interferon gamma after three days of stimulation. However, if these CAR T cells are removed from aged mice, treated with recombinant IL-37, and stimulated in vitro with these leukemia cells, you see there's a significant increase in the function of these cells and they make significantly more IO-2 and interferon gamma. So we wanted to take this a step further. We actually found a donor um, who was 67 years old to give us PBMCs. We made aged CD19 um, um, directed CAR T cells from, from this donor. And then we used xenograft studies where our mice were actually transplanted with human BLL cells. And then once signs of disease manifested in this context, we actually um, began treating these mice with these aged CAR T cells in the presence or absence of, of IL-37 for every five days for the duration of the experiment. And what we found is shown here, um, if the mice don't receive CAR T cells, they succumb very rapidly to disease. Um, even if you add recombinant IL-37, again, these are immunocompromised mice, so they don't have any T cells. You have to have T cells in the mice still succumb if you don't have them. Now, when we begin treating the mice with the CAR T cells, we do see that the CAR T cells are effective. Um, but the um, efficacy or the protective capacity of these CAR T cells can be improved when you actually start treating with recombinant IL-37 as an adjuvant. And so we were very excited um, about these results, and it really was a proof and concept that not only did IL-37 improve the function of endogenous T cells, but the ability to improve um, the function of these T cells really corresponded to the ability to protect the mice from a very aggressive form of BALL. And so the next thing that we're working on currently in my lab to follow up on these stories is we just received a provisional patent to actually make a new version of these CAR T cells. And these are CAR T cells that actually now express IL-37. Um, we are calling these um, armored CAR T cells um, all, um, based off the work that was um, performed by a colleague of mine, Dr. Saris Rafiq, and um, Ms. Aida Ankh, who is a second year cancer biology student in my lab, We'll be working to determine if these IL-37 armored CAR T cells actually protect um, in models of BLL and DLBCL, particularly in, 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 in the age backgrounds. And so with that being said, um, first of all, I would like to thank you guys for joining me. I want to thank my friends and collaborators at the University of Colorado, James, Charles, and Elon, who have been instrumental in helping me with these studies. Um, I also want to thank the groups at Emory, who I've worked with since I started my lab. Um, our funding sources, as you see here. And I also, before I end my talk and take questions, I want to put in a not so shameless plug for people to continue to uh, perform aging research and fund similar projects. And the reason is because I have a birthday coming up soon on January 28th. Um, this was me in 2008. As you see, if you fast forward a decade, now you're starting to see wrinkles popping up all over the place. So we really need to get this, um, these projects funded. And in data not shown, there's also some white and gray hairs that are starting to, to appear. So um, thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to addressing uh, whatever questions um, you may have. So thank you. Thank you, James and Curtis, for your fabulous presentations. My name is Lisa Galicchio. I'll be moderating a couple minutes of question and answer, and if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask, please enter them into the chat panels. I'll ask my first question to James. Given the work that you've done um, and the theory that you presented, how would you explain childhood or pediatric cancers? 
No, that's a great question. I, I get that a lot. Um, and so, so there are exceptions to the aging rule. You know, of course, if you look at all SEER data for all cancers, you hardly see childhood cancers because they're so minor compared to the late life cancer. So the first thing is, is that I, I mentioned that natural selection will work to prevent malignancies through youth. Now, natural selection is not perfect. So rare diseases like rare, you know, in the big picture of life, it's not to say that every childhood cancer is not incredibly tragic, but from sort of a natural selection perspective, the rate that the chance of dying from a childhood cancer completely paled in comparison to the chance of a child dying from infections and predation and all those other things. And so I think natural selection has been relatively weak against childhood cancers. That said, we also did some modeling, and it's only modeling, so I, we don't have data, but which suggested that the that one of the reasons that we may be getting childhood cancers is because the, the stem cell pool is very small during development and right at birth. And so by chance alone, through drift effects, you could get fixation of an oncogenic mutation. And so then if other events happen, it could go on to get cancer. So in other words, there may actually be sort of an evolutionary explanation for it in the sense that there's no way around it. If you go through a small stem cell pool, there's a risk that a bad thing can happen within a small stem cell pool that will just go to fixation. So the short answer is that it's, it's probably the case for many you know, diseases that are rare is that natural selection just isn't powerful enough to eliminate all causes of death through youth. And the next question I'll ask to Curtis. Have there been any data looking at non-pharmacological ways to increase IL-37, for example, diet and physical activity? So, uh, so first of all, that's a great question. Um, not to my knowledge, um, what, what we found in, in that, the data that I showed at the end was actually recently accepted for publication um, right on New Year's Eve. So, um, yeah, so we actually showed that with age populations in monocytes, you actually lose IL-37. Um, expression. So we know it does decline in human monocytes. Um, and I think this may be one of the first reports in humans that this gene actually goes down. And so one of the areas that we're going to focus on in my lab is try to look at is just across the board. So in, in individuals that actually maintain maybe a normal level of IL-37 in their monocytes, can we go back and look at donors and, and kind of go back and extrapolate anything that they're doing, diet, exercise, and then kind of backtrack and then come back to any type of interventions that can maintain IL-37 levels. So that's actually a really good question and something that we're going to try to dissect in my laboratory. And another question about IL-37 for Curtis. Does IL-37 level correlate with CAR-T responses in the clinic? So I'm actually working with some uh, investigators, uh, ironically, in Colorado to actually mine clinical data. Um, in my background, I'm a PhD uh, scientist, so, you know, I don't have access to the clinical data that I would like to, but the good part about it in my department, I'm in the clinical department. Um, it's a pediatric department, so we're kind of looking at uh, some of these things on the pediatric side, but I'm working with some investigators now in Colorado as of last month to try to mine this data from, from patients receiving CAR T-cell treatment, uh, predominantly from for DLBCL, for example. And so hopefully, again, um, a, a preview of, of things to come. So as of this time, we don't have an answer for that, but I really want to know if that's the case in the future. Great. Well, we're hitting the top of the hour, so I want to thank both our presenters again. Great presentations and good thought-provoking work for us to move forward with. I want to tell all of our webinar participants that we have two upcoming webinars scheduled, March 15th, we have Jessica Scott and Nathan Labrasser presenting. And May 3rd, we have Dan Belsky and Terry Moffitt. So we hope to see you then. And thank you again, Curtis and James. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much.